This podcast is brought to you by Club GG. Create clubs for free and subscribe to win over $200,000 in prizes. Welcome, everyone. We are back. It's been a break. It's been a while, but if we're going to take a couple months off for the first time ever, we're going to come back with a bang, and that's what we got today. We have the current reigning WSOP main event champion. 10 million cool gets put into his account. It's the man, Yespin. Yulin, I said Yespin, it's Espin. I was like, so trying to get your name right and I get it wrong. Espin, Yulin, Jorstadt, the man, the myth, the two-time bracelet winner. In two weeks, he gets two bracelets. Espin, how are you? Very good, thank you. Uh, I'm getting 10 mil into my account, but uh, some of that is quickly getting sent out of my account again. So yeah, yeah, a bunch of swaps and stuff, but uh, still very, very, very happy, of course. Of course. Well, you did You did put that on Twitter. I think it was talked about. You, you put out a spreadsheet, even said, look, I had swaps between one and 7.5%. Pretty pretty nice. 750 US to win 750 grand. Those friends, I'd say they're buying you at least when you're out to dinner for the next, uh, for, for a lifetime, I would hope they're, they're going to be taking care of you. But um, how, how are you feeling? Has it sunk in yet? You've got the 10 million. You're the the, the, the champion of the world in poker right now. How, do, how are you feeling currently? Uh, it still hasn't sunk in really. I'm feeling <laughs> that's a funny picture. First live cash, 10 million. <laughs> like, <laughs> that is funny. Uh, it has not sunk in for sure. Um, I'm just, yeah, I don't know. It's still, there's a lot of new impressions, you know, and a lot of people who want my attention now and like wants to do, uh, stuff. And it, it, I'm still just like trying to get, um, yeah, get on top of things. Um, but I don't feel like, I don't feel changed, you know? I feel like the same guy. I, I feel like myself. It's really weird, like, when I walk through Bally's, people come up to take, like, uh, selfies and high-five me and stuff, and I'm like, <laughs> uh, it's weird. It's a weird one. And yeah. and, and so you're from a small town. Can you tell me where in Norway specifically? What, what's uh, your town? Yeah, it's uh, Steinsjær. It's uh, close to Trondheim, which is one of the bigger cities in Norway. But my, t- my city is, like, 20K people or something. It's a very small, uh, beautiful place like nature. We live right by um, the lake or the sea. Uh, lake. No, it's like, what, what do you even call that? We live by the water. <laughs> and it's like beautiful nature there. But uh, not much going on. It's like a pretty uh, small city, right? So, yeah. And and you're, I got to ask you about your, your family. I know you, you, there was saying your mom was crying. She's your biggest fan. What does your family think of, well, forget about this moment, because obviously pretty exciting how do they feel about you when you dove into poker and you first started? Were they very supportive, skeptical, or did you even have to keep it kind of secret for a while? Bit of both, I guess. Like when I started, you know, like that was in 2004. And I I, I, I was like skipping school and stuff, skipping a lot of classes to play poker all night. And like, I don't think they loved it, like, which makes sense, you know, like I wouldn't love it either if my kid did this. Like they were very bullish on education and having like a normal uh normal life you know like normal job nine to five family like uh, get a degree they're very traditional you know so uh i played poker for a lot of years like from 2004 to 2009 10 around there um and then at some point you know like there was a lot of um i was getting kind of tired of the game i had been playing for a long time and i wasn't really uh, i had lost my passion for a bit uh, I wasn't really improving anymore. I was mostly just like bum hunting heads up cash games to like support my income or whatever. I wasn't really improving. Um, so I decided to um, get an education. So I went to school for six years, uh, got a master's degree, a little bit for myself, but also a little bit to like uh, keep my family happy <laughs> and like, uh, right. you know, give in, give in a little bit to that pressure. Um, so I went and got a degree and then I worked for one year um quit my job to start my own company um uh and at that point i was also playing poker uh to support uh i wanted to make like enough money from poker to build my own company you know and i was doing some twitch streaming and stuff like that and i got offered a poker sponsorship by a european company called unibet um and i signed with them and i kind of put my uh, company plans on the side i was starting a microbrewery in budapest hungary uh, so I was creating my own craft brewery, and I kind of put those plans uh, to the side to okay. pursue poker uh, and went all in on poker again. And then to, at this point, I was super hungry again. I, I really wanted to make it, and I really wanted to uh, become one of the best players and blah, blah, blah. Uh, I had like a newfound passion for the game, I would say. 
after being on the sidelines for a few years. I was playing poker every year, but I was not uh, really in the lab, you know. I wasn't studying, I wasn't doing much. I was just like playing on my like old skills, uh, which was enough to give me some supportive income. But yeah, I uh, found a new passion for the game and got back into it. I guess this was like 2017, 16, 17. Yeah. And, and your, would you say, is it something that was popular with your friends? Were you, is there any other guys growing up where you sort of like, you got into it together or were you sort of in your own on this when you got, when you found the game and started to dive in? I think that's why my passion died a little bit in the middle there because I didn't really have like a super solid poker network. I was mostly on my own and most of my friends, like the guys I was living with, they were uh, doing their own thing. You know, they were working jobs and getting an education and all of this. And I was kind of just like uh, in my own playing heads up poker basically. And it was kind of lonely, I think. Um, in the beginning, I had like a pretty good network in poker. Uh, I was playing a lot of video games, and one of my video game friends, he kind of drew me into poker. So that's how I got started. Um, I think he sent me like 50 bucks on Poker Stars, and I just like never looked back from that. Bought a bunch of books and was like super hungry in the beginning. Also in my hometown, there was a lot of people. Uh, one of my friends that was like one year older than me and two years older than me, they were super into poker. So I, I played a bunch of like $10, $20 home games with them, um, which was kind of... I think why I wanted to get so good because I wanted to impress like the older, cooler kids, you know, like I, I was never like a popular kid in school and whatever. And I found like, if I could like be super good in poker, maybe I could impress these guys, you know, and whatever. So I think that was like a big driver uh, back then. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's pretty amazing how poker has become, you know, mainstream. There's sort of like another wave. The numbers at the world series were absolutely incredible. What was your experience at the world series? this year versus the, the prior ones. Obviously you're a fan, right? Of the new venue, no matter what, you just you just won two bracelets in two weeks, um, including the main event. But what was your experience from this year versus uh, previous years at the Rio with being at Bally's Paris? This is my first World Series. Stop it. <laughs> People are so pissed about this. No yeah, way. This is my yeah, oh, so yeah, you don't, yeah, you don't, yeah, you don't even know. You don't even know what you're... What I was... have never been to Rio. I've never been to Rio. Wow. Wow. So let me just... Uh, we'll just kind of... That, that surprised me, I guess, because I was looking at your result. And that was, again, that's online. The GGWSOP. You did final table the main event during the COVID times, the 5K in or August, August 2021. So it was actually... Last there year, was there yeah. was still the twenty one the, the the October November WSOP yeah. live but you they did had two ones table. last year right they had one online and one uh, live and I final table the online one last year yes um but yeah no it, it it never really made sense for me to go to the World Series I was playing mostly cash games for most of my career uh, and when I transitioned to tournaments I was living in countries where poker was tax free as long as I was playing in Europe. But as long if I went to the US to play, I would be hit with a pretty big tax bill. So it never really made like financial sense when I could stay in Europe, play tax free, or I could go to the WSP and pay a bunch of taxes on a, on winnings. So from like a financial standpoint, it never really made sense to me to go here. Uh, but now I reside in London, so now it did make sense. Um, and wow. yeah, it's uh, pretty nice. Yeah, it's like it's something I still don't understand how the UK pays no gambling taxes, and then there's some countries in Canada or. Uh, as you mentioned, Norway or Germany, these different places, it's such a different law uh, and even the U.S. how it is. So it's pretty crazy. Tell me about this. This is exciting. Patrick Leonard, multi-podcast guest, great guy, big fan of his. And can you explain to me? Because I, I was thinking maybe you guys were childhood friends or been in the, in the grind together for 10 years, but this is not the case. Can you explain <laughs> your relationship with Patrick? Yeah, no. My relationship, like we've spoken online, uh, not like, and we haven't been like speaking every day online or anything like that. It wasn't like we were best friends, but we've been speaking online sometimes. Uh, but this was like actually the first time I met him in real life during this WSOP. We went for like a lunch early in the WSP and we were like hanging out a little bit. Uh, and then like it was pretty random that we ended up team teaming up in a tag team basically. Like I wasn't really plan planning on playing the tag team even. Uh, and he messaged me like pretty late on day one. Like, what are you up to? And I was like, yeah, I'm not much. And he was like, do you want to play the tag team? And I was like, yeah, cool, uh, sure. So we hopped in like pretty late on day one and we expected to bust pretty quickly. I don't remember how many big blinds we came in with, but it's not like the best structured tournament, you know? Like, it's not like the main event where you can late reg day two with 60 bigs or something like that. Uh, that was not the case. So we were expecting not to really uh, play for that long. <laughs> but right. uh, yeah, we ran hot and um, yeah. And and how did you 
how did you guys decide who played at what's who started who would take breaks I, I remember seeing patrick's social that it seemed like you were pretty militant right you guys were there sharing notes being a part of it were you actually with each other the whole time or most of the time or would you guys take breaks or get each other food and you know come back hours later or, or how did you guys m maneuver that that tournament yeah i think i start i think he played like one orbit then i played for a few hours and then he took over we we didn't have like a set plan for it in the beginning we uh, we kind of just did like okay now you play for a few hours i can go to the gym get some food whatever and then i'll come see you in a few hours and take over uh towards the end we played like okay so you play two hours i play two hours we i think we played pretty much 50 percent each throughout the tournament uh, on the final table as well we were like okay let's just swap whenever uh one or two people bust you know then we swap back in and out um and yeah was there any they, was there any like did anyone want like was it at the end because i don't believe and i might be wrong i don't think patrick had won a bracelet is that correct before that no it was specific? the first first one for both of for us both yeah. the first one so like who at the end when it's three-handed or heads up because there is something you know it's not about obviously you're both super competent players both run at once coaches and have a lot of experience and how did you guys decide who's going to finish it out? Because there's also something about being in the zone. Maybe one of these better heads up player, potentially more experienced. Maybe, you know, you're three, four handed and you're playing with the guys. It's different to like watch and swap in, right? You kind of, there is a bit of uh, trickiness there. How did you decide ultimately when there's three players left, how to, how to go about that? Or did you switch when it was three? Did you guys switch it at all or not until uh, the very end, like heads up or how did you do it? I think he played three handed. If I don't remember, if I'm right, and then I played uh, uh, most of the heads up, or I played like the first hour or whatever of heads up. I don't remember how long we played, uh, but we didn't have like a set plan. It wasn't like, okay, you're better three-handed, I'm better heads up. It wasn't anything right. like that. We were both like pretty confident in each other's game, I think. Um, so it was mostly just like, how do you feel? Do you want to play for a bit? Yeah, sure, I'll hop in. Uh, and it was very, yeah, not very no scientific approach really is <laughs> free selling and and did you have any other so what during that wsop so you win that event and then i think you mentioned that on the hen and mob you actually have multiple profiles is this is that is it sharing some back and forth or is this I, was there any other results at the wsop didn't you have another final table or something or no no i no. i got second yeah you see like i got second place in but that was like an online ring event or okay. whatever yeah. uh but i yeah like i had a pretty bad series before these two scores i i cashed my two first events which was like two pretty small events and then i had like 19 bullets in a row or something like that that i bricked 18 or 19 bullets in a row where i just bricked everything um and then i win the tag team I go pretty deep in another event and then I win the main event <laughs> with like one one bullet in between there that I busted in the winner or something. So it's like insane heater towards the end. Uh, and, absurd. And tell me about your trajectory in the main where can you kind of give me not every day, but give me sort of like a day one, two sort of how did you start was day one? Was it hot from the beginning? Did you sort of just maintain and, and ignite? Yeah. How did it go? I, I remember I went to like a barbecue party with a bunch of poker people after day one uh because there was like some days of break in between there so i went to a barbecue and everyone was like talking about how did you do day one in the main and everyone had like uh five starting stacks and stuff like that people had bagged like pretty big stacks and i had bagged like less than a third of a starting stack i think i had like 18k or something going into day two from 60k no starting you yeah, yeah, 18. yeah i was like at wow. 17 point something going into day two so I was like, uh, yeah, I bagged this like dog shit stack. <laughs> and people were like, yeah, you know, like you can always spin it up. It's the main event. You still have 30 bigs and uh, don't worry about it. And I was like, yeah, I mean, sure. Uh, but I, I didn't have like super high expectations or whatever going into day two, obviously. Uh, and then day two, I ran just super hot. I, I think I bagged 460K or something after day two, starting from 18K. So that was absurd. Wow. Um, and then every day after that, I bagged uh, between, yeah, I, I bagged like between one and three average stacks uh, every day after that, basically. Just ran really pure and was never really in danger until um, I think I was all in one Sunday five or something where I got super lucky. I was all in with Queen Jack suited versus Pocket Kings for like an 80 big blind pot. Um, got a flush. You're all in uh, pre-flop? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was You're pretty bad play by me. This was like probably my biggest mistake during the main event, I think. Like I open under the gun seven uh, of like 40 bigs. Uh, he three bets me in the hijack. 
uh, I four bet chip on him like for forty bigs, and and it's a play that's like if you're in late position, it's a legit play. Like if you're hijack cut off or cut off button, but early versus hijack, it's very punty. Like you're only supposed to use like your suited ace x here, ace five suited, ace four suited, whatever. Um, but I, but I felt like his raise fold gap here is gonna be insane. You know, he's never gonna three bet call off ace queen or ace jack here for that many bigs. You know. Uh, if he does it with Ace King, we're doing okay against that. And he's gonna have all like he was he was a like an American regular, you know. And he's gonna like three bet fold the uh, Ace Ten off, Ace Jack off, Ace Queen off, um, King Jack off. He he was like pretty aggressive, and I felt like he was gonna be super wide. Um, I'm not sure if that wow. was a valid read or not. Wow, Maybe. that's it that's insane. I mean, it just like that's not because that's not like a it's not like you had twelve blinds, right? Like this is a lot. Yeah, yeah. How many people yeah, yeah. left? Was there still hundreds left? Oh yeah, this is day. F I think it was like day five. Um, so a couple we were hundred. in the money. We were in the money, but um, yeah, three three hundred or four hundred or so. Probably wow. a play I should not be making. Like my theory going into the main event is that, like, because everyone says like you should play careful because people are gifting you stacks left and right. There's a lot yeah. of recreationals in this field who will just gift you stacks right. But my my approach was like I want to play pretty aggressive in these spots. Like you want to accumulate a lot of chips because. Imagine going into uh, the late stages of this tournament with a lot of chips. You can put so much pressure on people. So I had like a pretty aggressive approach throughout the tournament, but I think this hand is just bad. <laughs> I think it's just a punt off, honestly. Um, I don't think it's like losing heaps, but I think it's very unnecessary in this tournament. So wow. yeah, but I got lucky. He flopped a king, which makes it even sicker. He flops a king. I flop a flush draw. I turn a flush. Rick River. Uh, I felt pretty bad for the guy. But, uh, yeah, he was a really nice guy as well. So. Yeah, wow. anyways i had yeah. that hand and then i had another hand where i got like super lucky uh it was like set over set and i river quads um we got it in on river like it was like a pretty interesting hand i don't know if you want to hear too many hand yeah. histories here no, i don't know what not... kind of this is this is i mean this is very, i mean to me i love the butterfly effect i love you know the helmuthian style people say i'm never all in or you know this and that but like to hear like you know joe Cotto was down to two blinds or these th different stories and, and it's very interesting so yeah please give me a hand and i mean that's 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 a wild one that's a wild one as well so let's hear what happened there yeah yeah okay so it was like uh early position opens uh hijack calls um oh what's his name john raisner mm -hmm. he won the main event some one year right or came second 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 yeah. Came second yeah, yeah yeah i didn't know who he was at the time he was wearing sunglasses and it was pretty uh, anonymous looking um, he, he actually got one of the sickest ladders ever. That was where Joseph Chiang and Duhamel were three-handed with all the chips, and he was super short in third. Like, I don't know. I don't want to make up the blinds, but, like, say sub-10, and they had, like, a lot, and they got an A7. Joseph Chiang, like, seven bet or six bet all in with A7 off into Queens, and then Racener ended up laddering, and it was, like, a very short heads up because he was so short. Uh, but, yeah, that yeah, so, but, yeah, he's a very good player. Yeah, he's got some great results, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyways, so he flats the hijack. I flat big blind with uh, pocket fours. Okay. Flop comes nine, seven, four, two diamonds. Uh, I check, opener checks, uh, race in their bets like one third or 40% or something. Uh, I check race quite chunky, like 4x or something. Uh, opener folds, race in their calls. Uh, there's two diamonds on the flop. Turn is Jack of Diamonds. So one of the worst cards in the deck for me, I think. Yeah. Um, like he's going to have, a, of course, a bunch of flushes. He's going to have pocket jacks. 10-8 uh, suited, probably not. I wasn't sure how he was playing, if he was flatting 10-8 suited pre here or not. But yeah, it's a pretty bad card. Um, I'm not really sure how I should approach this card because a lot of my bluffs on the flop as well here, you know, are going to be either Diamonds or 10-8, right? So it's a good card for both of us, but um, yeah. So I, I'm still not sure how I should approach this spot. If I should just like have a bunch of like super small bets to put his like uh, ace nine suited, pocket tens, whatever in the bin, you know, or if I should just play a lot of checking. Uh, anyways, I check. He bets like sixty percent or something pot. We're we're quite deep to start a hand. He bets like sixty percent pot. Um, I think this is day three or something, pretty early in the tournament. Uh, and, and I feel like uh, at this point, I felt like he's not going to bet if he has like sevens or nines or whatever, uh, or jacks even. He's probably going to play a lot of checkbacks because he doesn't want to get uh, check jammed on on the turn with all these sets. It's pretty 
cross spot for him if he bets here and I jam. Um, because he's almost just getting odds to call off to try to get a boat on the river, I think. Yeah. Because the pot is pretty big at this point, right? So I didn't really expect him to have sets. I expected him to have uh, a lot of flushes and not really that many bluffs. It's kind of hard for him to have bluffs here as well. Yeah. Um, he's going to have to like float flop with like ace queen off with ace of diamonds and stuff like that and then bluff the diamond runouts, which I wasn't sure if he was doing that, you know, like. Yeah, yeah, I didn't have really much info on the guy. So anyways, I call. Uh, River is another four, so I get quads. Uh, and I felt like this is a really good card for me. Like, he has a lot of flushes. I have a lot of sets uh, in this, that the way the hand was played. So it's probably a card I get to lead on. Um, so I lead jam, which I think is good. Uh, if I don't expect him to have boats, I have a lot of boats. Questionable, like, what sort of bluffs would I have here? Like, it's hard for me... It's really hard for me to have bluffs here. Like, what would I bluff? Uh, you could say, like, okay, if I have, like, a 7-9 suited or something like that. But I think I honestly check full turn with 7-9 suited. So I probably have zero bluffs here, <laughs> which <laughs> which makes the hand kind of strange. Um, right. Yeah. But I lead jam, and he has pocket sevens, and he's just, like, uh, hating life. Be like, I, I think he feels that he's beat here. He was hating life, but it took, like, a few seconds and then called off. Uh, I show my force, he shows his sevens and says, I, I knew you had force, but I just couldn't, yeah. Wow. So that was a big double up. Uh, and of course, if the river is anything else, I'm not sure if the river is, let's say the river is like a queen of clubs or whatever here. I'm not sure if it goes check, check, or if it goes check, jam, fold, I guess, because he doesn't really have bluffs done. Right. Yeah, so I probably don't go broke, but of course, like I would have a lot less chips if this four doesn't or what yeah what if it's a seven right or if the board pairs that's uh, if the board pairs i'm going broke for sure yeah any exactly. board pairing and i'm lead jamming and then i go broke yeah. so yeah it's just like an insane insane one outer to basically yeah right as you say like the butterfly effect i, I would probably not have won the tournament right if i didn't hit this one outer so it's like yeah, a one outer if, tournament even if, it, even if it goes yeah. check check right if the river's something that decide the pot doesn't get huge it's still a huge swing you're going to lose the pot and you yeah know, yeah it's all it's all yeah, it's, it's all crazy so i mean that's it that, you you play for that many days. There's going to be these type of hands. There's going to be some luck. Yeah. There's going to be some some amazing situations. But you know how how smooth the ride was it once you got sort of down past day five, like where you you were pretty much in control and never at risk, where you sort of just covering people and and pleasantly chipping up. Yeah, for the most part. Um, yeah, after that, I don't really think I was all in again until we were like fourteen people left or something uh, when I got in aces versus ace king for like cheap lead pot. Um, like I open an early position, Tom Kunze, German pro, three bets me. We were like the two chip leaders at the table. Wow. He three bets me, I four bet, he ships it with Ace King. I snap it off and uh, we hold. Um, and that was for like a lot of chips at that point. Um, so that was like the next time I was all in, I think. Like between the Queen Jack suited where I beat Kings and this Ace's hand, I think I was like hovering around 2x average, 3x average for most of the tournament. Just getting a lot of good cards and yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's uh it's it's pretty pretty spectacular. When did you feel you actually could win? Because it's gotta be nice to have that bracelet. It's a tag team event. You and Patrick check that off your bucket list as winning a bracelet. So maybe a little extra is kind of like feeling good, relax. But when did you actually like, all right, I can be the main event champion? When did you start thinking about that? I think it was after this uh, Aces versus Ace King half, where I was like chip leading with um 13, 14 people left or whatever it was, you know. And uh, the field was looking great at that point. There was not that many professionals left. Uh, and I had the chip lead. And I I've studied a lot of ICM. It's probably the part of the game tree, I think, where I feel like I have the most edge. Because a lot of people now, you know, like uh, 2022, a lot of the pros have studied a lot, uh, like single race pots, button versus big blind. Most people know how to play different boards. And people know how to play like uh, the regular spots at this point, you know. There's not that much edge to be gained there. But I think like in ICM, there's still like a very big discrepancy like between professionals even, like how they approach it. And it's one of the parts of the game tree that I have studied the most, where I feel like I probably have the most edge. So mm -hmm. at that point, I felt pretty good. But of course, it's tournament poker and... Like you have the chip lead, but like one cooler the wrong way, and suddenly you're, yeah, in ninth place or whatever, right? So yeah. I wasn't like, okay, this is my tournament now, but I felt really good at that point, yeah. And how did the heads up battle go? How how was that? How long did it last? And what was the? How was your opponent? That was kind of ridiculous because on day six or something, I was playing a lot with Attenborough, 
And honestly, at that point, I felt he was the strongest uh, competitor I had left in a tournament. He was getting the best of me in a lot of spots. Uh, and I felt, okay, if there's anyone I don't want to reach heads up with, it's this guy. Because he's very sticky, very tough, very aggressive. Um, so at that point, I he was like the toughest player left in the field, I think. Uh, so when I get him heads up, I was like, okay. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty ridiculous. Um, the heads up was pretty long time-wise, but hands-wise, it wasn't that long. Because a lot of it was uh, tanking, you know, like... The one hand that we played, like the infamous Jack Four versus King Queen, I guess that was like the longest tanked hand. Like the whole hand lasted like forty or forty-five minutes or something. I think we were like five minutes away from CBS having to pull the plug, like uh, or having to tell Attenborough, like, okay, you have like two minutes left on the clock or whatever, because they were close to like reaching, because uh, we're it's streamed right with like an hour delay or something, so we were close to catching up on the delay. So I think CBS was like getting ready to call the clock on him. Okay, uh, so so not from a standpoint of wow, this is like for TV, it's not great. This is like saying just from a legis legitimately just like gaming integrity and like the delay. And yeah, stuff. yeah, because uh, yeah, it was gonna catch up, and the rail could tell him if you have better than King Queen call. If you have worse than King Queen fold, you know, we were getting close to that point. Wow. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, that's uh, that's pretty interesting. I mean, what and what in your from your perspective, what do you think about that? Because, I mean, for your tanking, like, what's the longest tank you had throughout the whole tournament, would you say, roughly? Uh, less than this one, for sure. But uh, to his credit, he was one of the fastest players throughout the whole tournament. When I was playing with him before, he was he, he had premeditated most of his decisions. And he's, like, a very smart and good player. He knew his ranges, and he wasn't, like, he wasn't balancing his timing or anything like that. He just knew what to do, and he made his decisions. So to his credit, he was playing, uh, on average, I spent more time than him on decisions during the tournament, you know? Okay. A lot of so people are giving him flack now on Twitter and whatever. A lot of yeah. people are like, oh, yeah. Like, but honestly, also people were asking me, like, why don't you call the clock on him in this spot? Uh, and I was like, I, I would never call the clock on anyone in this spot, no matter what, you know? Right, like, yeah, you biggest, guys are playing for spot of $4 million. Like, look, you, yeah. you're not in a hurry. You're, you don't have dinner plans. You know, you can relax a little and, and it's all good. It's in the good sports. Yeah. You guys aren't. Yeah, yeah, taking, yeah. It's the biggest spot for biggest spot in both of our lives. You know, like calling the clock there would be very unsportsmanlike in my yeah. opinion. A lot of people say like it's part of the game, like calling the clock. It's in your rights to do and it's part of the game. I don't really see it like that. I, I, I would like it's a complex spot and it's for a lot of money. Like he, he deserves to be able to think it's completely true. Right. So. Yeah. yeah. And, and, um, I, I gotta, gotta, gotta mention, you know, you had the GG score for 600 K online, the, the WSOP and in, in the year before, and you did qualify technically, of course we said you will play, right. You were going to play the main, obviously a 10 K and you play high stakes and you've had scores and you're a, a coach for run at once you do video. So playing the main event, but you did get in for technically a thousand. Is that correct? On club on GG is you won a satellite. Is that right? On GG, yeah. I played a 1K satellite and won the ticket. I won like a package, like a 12.5K package on GG uh, a few months before the WSOP, I think. And I saw you were wearing a patch for GG. I am obviously biased. I'm an ambassador for, for GG. I love the site and um, everything that goes with it. But I got to ask you personally, what was that experience like to get a deal or to, to be patched up? Or was that part of winning the package? Are you supposed to wear the patch because you won the package? Or was that a separate deal of course that you don't have to tell me what they gave you or whatever i just want to know is that like side deal or was that like in clumpus that hey you want a package no side deal no side deal um of course you th there was like uh um a last longer for wearing the patch like the pe person who wore the patch longest gets like a 10k package to wsop um which is like of course that like yeah, I don't know how much to say about this, but like maybe maybe I was wearing the patch more in terms of having some goodwill later on, you know, in terms right. of maybe negotiating like an ambassadorship or something at some point. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm at this point, like in my poker trajectory, I'm, the goal is to reach the high stakes, travel around, play all the big stops, uh, create content around it. I'm quite active on social media and I'm also... Uh, now hired like a videographer and a full-time editor to create vlogs and stuff like that show like a bit behind the scenes what's going on at this high stakes tournaments uh hopefully meet up with guys like you and other high stakes players at these stops and get like some 
behind the scenes footage and like some storytelling and whatnot. I'm not too interested in like showing uh, hand histories and solver outputs and stuff like that. I yeah. think that would be the content that I would prefer to make because it's like my comfort zone, you know, like the solver yeah. stuff. But it's not really what people want to see, you know, like most people don't really care about the solver stuff. Most people play on like a semi uh, hobby level or like um, they try to improve the game, but they're more, more interested in like emotions, storylines, stuff like this, you know, I think. So if you want to reach like a good audience with uh, vlogging or whatever, I think that's probably the way to go. So that's the plan for me um, to go around and do this. And it's not a secret, of course, like I, I would like to um, also sign up with a big company to uh, be an ambassador for them, you know, uh, in poker or outside of poker. I think it makes a lot of sense to have these ambassador deals going if you're going to be a content creator. Uh, first of all, like, of course, you make some money with that, but also it adds validity to your name. It adds exposure. Uh, these companies can help you reach a wider audience. And I, I think as a content creator, uh, if you're doing it without any sponsorships or whatever, it's going to like hinder your growth. It doesn't really make sense. So yeah, maybe I was also wearing the patch in terms of maybe having some goodwill there later. I don't know. I, I love it. Well, yeah, I'll, I'll flash over one more time. I mean, like I said, I just officially got on board with GG and they are the world's largest poker site and a, a lot of great great people involved there some some of the bigger names Negranu, Elki, you know, Fedor and and many others that'll just sign as well so I I would be from the little time I got to know you and the great things I've heard I would be amazing if you were able to um find your way to GG Poker so that you know I'm, I'm biased maybe I'm you biased, maybe though. you put in a good word for me I'm gonna send him a clip <laughs> I'm gonna send him a clip right now you know Michael Kim everyone there this is uh I'm endorsing my 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 personal endorsement that our time together I've enjoyed and uh yeah I do hope to meet in person and and we have some mutual friends Henry Kilbane and Patrick Leonard two guys I respect and and you know great guys that I know right, you're guys, very close with sure. so um and and speaking of Henry Kilbane speaking of Overbet Express and content explain to me a bit about Overbet Express that's something I have actually caught before I know there's been some good success and deep runs and you guys have really kind of put together your own your own content team explain to me what that is and what your involvement is with Overbet Express yeah so it was five of us that started it um me Philip Blank the vi videographer uh Henry Kilbane uh all around kind of guy he does a lot of stuff he streams he commentates he does a lot of stuff right uh Jonas uh Gelstad is a Norwegian friend of mine I've known him since forever I've known him for like 15 years or something he crushed poker crushed sports betting now he's uh, dabbling in both worlds uh and then Benjamin Borland who's like a young up-and-coming PLO crusher he's like 22 or something and he's played some of the biggest stakes in PLO uh, so it's the five of us, we started this to create content. We, we we weren't sure where to take it really, and we still are not sure where to take it. It's kind of like a bit up in the air in terms of what we're going to do going forward. Um, we've done some streaming, we've done uh, some vlogging, we've done some educational content. We've done a lot of stuff, but we're not really sure where to take it. So uh, yeah, people can go check that out on different socials uh, and see see if we <laughs> find some cool stuff to put out. Yeah, we have a homepage as well. We've never announced this homepage anywhere, actually. it's uh, We made it. It's pretty much finished, I guess. Uh, but we haven't really... Uh, it's, uh, world it's not linked anywhere. Ex exclusive. Exposed. Right here. Exposed. <laughs> <laughs> Beta version. Um, there it is. And, and it looks like, are you making some run at once videos? Is that what's happening there? No, th this is uh, when I streamed the final table of the WSP main event last year um because i was streaming that and we were like vlogging and making behind the scenes content for that as well it looks like a really yeah. nice setup i'm a, I'm a bit of a um i get excited about nice setups with monitors and and comfortable and it's yeah, i, yeah, I yeah. take a lot of pride in that it looks like a beautiful setup where is that and was that your guys home base yeah that was in london uh that was our home base i was living with uh, jonas and and ben and then henry and philip came and lived with us for a bit as well it was like a big ass house with a bunch of guest rooms and it was a great house. We don't have that house anymore, but yeah. Yeah, hey, you guys um, might be upgrading. You, you, a lot of people, you said you had 56% <laughs> of your main event. A lot of people with some 1%, 7.5%. I'd say Overbet Express is uh, in good shape, right? I mean, they're well-funded now, I would imagine. There's some people with some swaps, and um, it looks like yeah. you guys are on your way. Um, the train is moving for sure, so that's uh, very exciting. What about social media? What do you enjoy the most? Twitter, Instagram, here we see your... Your Instagram, which site, and are you doing your own? Do you have a social media team or do you post your own stuff normally? 
I just do all my own stuff. I don't have anyone doing social media for me. Uh, I think Instagram is where I'm most active, like Instagram stories. I I spam those quite a bit, uh, just showing like behind the scenes and doing some educational content on stories as well, doing like some hand history quiz stuff, showing some solver outputs, just like trying to do a little bit of everything and see what sticks. I, I was never that big on social media before. I, I don't have like, it doesn't come very natural to me. Neither mm -hmm. does this, like being on camera and all of this. It's very like, I'm trying to like break through um, in terms of comfort zone. Uh, my comfort zone is just being by myself, looking at solver outputs, playing online poker. That's my comfort zone. Being in front of the camera and trying to be like a funny, charismatic dude, not my comfort zone. <laughs> I'm more of like a nerd. I'm, yeah. I'm like a anti-social nerd from, um, from the past. So yeah, was... I'm trying to reach out. I'll say this, I, I, it's hard to believe because you do a great job. We obviously, we, we did the Coin Rivet pod as well. And uh, you seem very charismatic, very genuine, very humble. And uh, I think you're gonna have a bright future. I think that that's actually one of the more interesting things in poker because we see these guys like the Jason Kuhn, Stephen Chidwicks, uh, you know, I can name a hundred guys that are like the top 0.01% of the players that play the highest stakes in the world. It's, uh, it's rare to find people that are like elite, elite in poker and also do content. Part of it, I think, is just time, right? There's only so much time. You want to study solvers. You want to get great at poker. Yep. How can you possibly do everything? So I think that, you know, it's really interesting to have people that that are finding a way to to kind of be a hybrid, right? That can do some of both and, and find a way. And it sounds like, you know, you're looking to kind of tackle that, right? It's it's almost, it's tricky. What do you think is harder to be like the best poker player or one of the best players and then get really good at content? Or do you think being at content and getting good at poker? What do you think is kind of harder to calibrate? For me, the content part is way harder. Um, I, I was streaming like for a few years, like from like 2017 to 19, maybe I was streaming a bunch of cash games. And at some point I was like, you know what? I don't feel like my poker progression is steep enough. I wasn't getting better at a fast enough rate. I felt like just because I didn't have like the capacity, energy, time, whatever to study. Like you stream for nine hours or whatever. My brain is fried after this. I can't sit down and like look at solver outputs or whatever. I'm done. Yeah. I'm done and I need to do something else. Well, it's so, as you know on Twitch, right? Because you're, you're following the chat. You're playing multiple tables. And then it's not just that. You got to plan before. You got to plan after. You got to do stuff and set up. And it's not just like click live and and go. So yeah. for sure, I'd agree. I would agree with that. Um, I'm biased as well. But it's just hard, right? That's why I give so much credit to people that are able to do, you know, the Kevin Martins and you know, Jamie Staple, guys that are like really working hard to like get mm -hmm. better at poker, but they're also putting in this, sure. this content. It's, it's, it's not easy. So, and I think there's more respect now with content. I think for a while that the top players weren't really giving respect to like content creators. They're kind of like, oh, these guys aren't good at poker as, as like a fundamental thought, but really it's kind of for poker to work and grow. I think you need to have both. You got to have people that are willing to do content. You got to have people that are willing to put the work in and be elite and, and kind of finding a nice way, almost like a, a tag team, right? It'd be kind of cool, like find like a great content creator and a great player and you kind of find a way that you have to want it though. Both players That's have to want to get better. So, you know, I, I would love to tag you in on that concept with me for that. But speaking of tag teams, I want to segue to tag teaming and you and Rob Young just announcing that you're the first team officially for the Mediterranean poker uh, tournament going on that's Luxon and Coin Rivet focused the $200,000 buy-in in Cyprus at the Merit starting in September. I believe it's uh, on the 10th or 9th of September. So congrats on that. That's exciting. How does that feel to, to, to know you're officially playing a $200,000 buy-in tournament? It's very exciting. Uh, of course, this tournament is very special because it's uh, 32 pros that get uh, businessmen, um, businessmen, recreationals, whatever you want to call it, um, that gets to invite professionals. Like no professional can just enter this tournament. You need an invite from a businessman. Um, so uh, Rob Young was nice enough to invite me, which is very cool. I It's going to be a big tournament. Like the biggest I've played before is a 25K, right? And this is a 200K buy-in, which is insane. I'm obviously going to sell a bunch of action for it. I'm not going to just take a 200K piece by myself. I think that would be a bit reckless. Um, I, I just want a bunch of money, but I, I want to keep some of that money for a few years. You know, I don't want to, yeah. I don't want to be one of those guys. I've heard about like some main event winners in the past who maybe didn't hold on to their fortune for too long because they were taking a lot of risks, playing a lot of big games and 
being a bit spewy with their bankrolls, perhaps. I don't want to repeat that mistake. Uh, I, I'm quite like, a, I wouldn't say risk averse because I'm not. I'm single. I don't have any responsibilities in life. I don't have anyone to, like, if I fuck up and I lose all my money, that's on me. And uh, yeah, that's fine. I would have to rebuild. I don't have it. Like, I wouldn't ruin anyone else's life, you know? I think it's a bit different when you have a family to support or whatever. You have to be a bit more risk averse. Uh, I don't have that, so I can take some risk. But I'm not going to... Um, but I'm not going to go all in and like try to spin these uh, 6 million or whatever I have now into uh, 40 million or whatever. It doesn't really make sense, right? If you have right. $6 million, you're, you're, you kind of have enough to, uh, if you play your cards right, it should be enough to for a lifetime, right? Um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's well said. And I, I know, again, this is, uh, you said you've been there. I think you said you were in Cyprus before, but the Luxon yeah. Pay Mediterranean poker party schedule is out. We can you know, take a kind of look at that. And, and the 200, is that something where you like to warm up? You think you'll just focus on that? Or will you maybe go in and play some of the stuff and get warmed up, acclimated, come to the event? You can see the different buy-ins and, and what's happening there uh, for some of the, the bigger stuff. What, what, what is a plan when you approach a series like this? I'll play everything. Um, I'm not going to play the first stuff. Like, I'm probably not going to play the one case. Um, wait, when does it start? The Yeah, so I'll probably come in on, like, the 26th or something, I think. I don't think I'll play the first week, because the first week is, like, uh, relatively low stakes, right, compared to the rest of it. I yeah. think they've basically divided it in, like, three different weeks, where it goes from, like, uh, low stakes to mid-high stakes to, like, super nosebleeds with the Triton at the end, right? Yep. Um, yeah, it kind of looks like the first, uh, yeah, it'd be like a 10K, the charity one drop where it's at 1100, but 10K plus that. So the 28th is kind of your first higher stakes. And then it, it nicely ties into that 5K, 5 mil main event, which is juicy. Yeah. So that would be fun. And then, yeah, I mean, it's a long time too, right? Even if you get there the 28th, you're there for, could be there for three weeks. Um, yeah, yeah. Before I think that. that's the plan coming around there and just play, um, play a lot, play a lot of poker for the next few weeks and see how it goes. And, and what about these Triton events? So you'll play the 200K with Rob Young as your business partner. So again, to understand that, that is similar to the 1 million Triton in July 2019, whereas one businessman and one pro, there's 26, call it teams, but in, it's not really a team. You're not like tied to Rob's result. He's just, You're an invite and the pros play together on day one for eight levels. And then the businessmen play together for eight levels. So they're doing this time a 200K with one rebuy, not... 1 million or 200 freeze out. So it's basically because most you'd be in is 400K. Uh, and you can see that there it is Saturday, September 10th. That starts. Will you play some of the other Triton events maybe or going to see how it goes, feel it out? No, I'll, I'll play. Uh, I'm not going to say I'm going to play the full schedule because I haven't really had time to think enough about it. I just got the invite. So I haven't really had time enough to sit down and look at the schedule. I have to sort out financials as well, uh, see how many people would be interested in buying my action. Um, and I have to sort out cash as well. I, I still have yet to be paid by WSP. I need to sort out some tax number stuff here. So I'm waiting for that. So there's some um, stuff to fix before this. Right. But I'm planning to play a lot. I think it's. Uh, I think Triton is one of those. You know, for me, poker is more interesting when uh, I can play with the very best players. That when I'm having. That's when I'm having the most fun playing poker. If I can sit and play with uh, the Mikitas and the Linuses and whatnot, because Sitting there and playing um, WSOP, for example, with uh, a bunch of stuff you know nothing about, it's interesting in the way that you can like try to figure out what people is up to. It's like a whole new world, basically, basically to discover, right? While while you're at the Triton stops, you have all these amazing players that I've been looking up to for a lot of years. You know, like uh, Linus and uh, Mikita, for example, they're two of my favorite players in the world. So if I can sit there and play with them and like really pay attention to what they're doing, like look at their bet sizings, their lines, uh, and try to figure out what they're doing. This is like my favorite part of poker. It's when I'm having the most fun. So I'm really excited about this last week, especially getting to play these uh, nosebleeds games with these absolute beasts. Yeah, that's uh, no, for sure. And it's, it's obviously like you can watch some of the footage, you can see the final tables, you can do stuff. But you know, to your point, being able to take it in, watch them live, also get to chat to them a bit on the side, right? That's the cool part about these exclusive small field high buy-ins. Like people talk, you hang out, you have a drink with someone, talk to them. And and uh, it's really, it's a, it's a great environment and Triton does a great job. So that'll be a lot of fun. I'm happy to be over there and 
get to meet if we I, I guess we'll meet there if not in uh, florida i think you did say you're playing the hard rock though the 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 stuff coming up at seminal yeah. in in florida what will you play there specifically i think i'm just gonna play three tournaments probably the 5k main the 25k high roller and the 50k super high roller i think um I'm still a bit undecided about the 50k because I also have to sort cash for Miami to go there. It's a bit like of a logistic mess now because I have to sort cash for all of these things. I'm going to LA after this stop as well to play some high stakes cash games. And I'm going to have to sort cash for that as well. And it's like, yeah, I have to talk to some people and see how I can sort this in the best way. I hope um, you have a Lux on Coin Ribbit. This is not a this is not a podcast for that, but <laughs> I, if you don't have that, I'm going to give it a plug because that is the key to life for for gaming and, and and poker. Do you do you have one of those or not yet? I have a Luxon account. Yeah, it's it's the same. Luxon is Coin Ribbit tied. You just that's how you like sw uh, okay, swap. Okay, okay. Okay. So we'll we'll talk about that. And in Miami, I can definitely help you out. And I'm sure um, people know you're well fun. You're you're in good spot. People, you know, poker poker world's very friendly and accommodating. So I'm sure people can. Can help you you'll be fine rob already alluded to earlier he said look don't worry show up if you have an issue if the money's not there yet you know he'll make sure you're sorted out to play because that is yeah, part of it right super helpful that's, like, that's nice mindfulness to just like know you can mm. show up and relax not have to like stress and figure the wires out and do all these things so for sure um, for that's sure. uh that's very cool and i know we gotta wind it down here last couple questions i was talking to what is henry kilbane to you is he is he go can we call him a, the guy's such a legend but is he your assistant is he helping he's he's pinging me on the side says we have a few more minutes but i know you got a busy day what is your team consist of currently uh with, with like henry and what, what is everyone sort of helping you with so henry and philip uh, henry kilbane and philip blank they flew in a couple of days ago to vegas they're going to be um, assisting me in trying to sort out what the hell is going on here because I'm a bit overwhelmed. Uh, Philip is the videographer guy, uh, content strategy. He's like super uh, in tune with uh, meme culture and what's going on on the internet. Yeah. Um, big gamer. So he's like kind of the content strategy guy. Um, Henry is uh, taking on the role as like uh, uh, every my right hand man at the moment, just like helping me sort stuff out in terms of. Uh, what games to play, where to go, um, networking in terms of like meetup games and all kinds of stuff. He's helping me out with everything at the moment. Uh, we haven't like officially, like I haven't hired him as a, my assistant or anything uh, yet. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see how that develops. But both of these guys are two of my best friends. Uh, we lived in Thailand together for a lot of months. Uh, we lived in, for five months in Thailand very recently as well. So they're two of my best friends. And yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll see what, how we, how we figured this out, but yeah, good to have them here at least. Amazing. And what would you like to be? So main event champs, so many, so many great people, so many great winners, so many different personalities. What would you like to be remembered for as the World Series of Poker main event champion? What would be you'd like people to say about you as a as a representative and ambassador for the game? Uh, if I have to like uh, compare me with one of the previous winners, I guess I'm relatively similar to Martin Jacobson. Okay. in terms of like both being uh, very like health conscious uh, focused on like eating healthy working out meditating doing everything we can to keep like mind and mind and body healthy uh, i think that's going to be like my main uh, goal as an ambassador try to inspire people to be healthier i, I think like a lot of poker people uh, they kind of take health not for granted but they don't take it as seriously as they should i think um, because like, for example, playing the main event, you play for 10 days straight. Uh, I think that's where like having the uh, resilience to like getting tired and whatever, if you're in good shape and you uh, prioritize sleep and healthy habits and whatever, you're, you're going to have a better shot at uh, maintaining a focus for that long. Right. Uh, and I think I want to be like a good role model for younger, younger, younger people coming up in poker who, um, yeah, who see like because you see like some parts of poker, you see some people uh, living that like party lifestyle. They travel a lot, they party a lot, and it's like very uh, freedom and party oriented lifestyle, right? I would rather try to focus on the the healthy uh, aspect of poker, like studying, trying to master your craft, doing everything you can to uh, master your craft in the best way possible, basically. Uh, and I think you see that a lot in the high stakes scene now, right? It used to be like 10 years ago, you would see people uh, playing high stakes, like drinking, smoking weed, doing like all kinds of stuff, you know, and they would still win money because poker was so easy then. 
today uh, at the top level, it's very competitive. You see all these guys, uh, like Jason Kuhn is the best example, right? Look at the guy. He's like a beast. He's an absolute beast. And you, you see a lot of these people, they do focus a lot on health, fitness, uh, meditation, journaling, whatever they can. So I think that's, um, yeah, I, I want to aspire to that. And I want to inspire other people to be like that as well. For sure. And last, lastly, I want to just understand you to re reiterate your first ever World Series. You've never been in the Rio. You're at Bally's. You're at Paris. You know, GG, WSOP sort of aligning powerful brands, biggest brands. You know, shout out to Jack Ethel, Michael Kim, you know, putting on, doing everything, making sure this was, I know they were even wanting to do more. You know, it's kind of, there's little tweaks and it was the first year there. What was your overall takeaway from that? How, how do you feel like the venue was? And how was it run and set up? You're probably biased because you won two bracelets and 10 million plus, but it was great. Yeah, everything yeah. was great. I love it. Change, don't change a thing, right? Everything's perfect. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, give me like a little, give me one thing you might want to see adjusted and what was great from your experience. Um, it's hard for me to see. I, I don't have much to compare it with in terms of WSP, right? I've played a lot of other tournament series in Europe mostly. Uh, so I don't have that much to compare it with in that sense. There was like some some events where the lines were absurd in the beginning of the series. I remember the lines were going like out of the out of the building. Basically, you would wait in hours, for, um, wait for hours to get um, to get playing. Uh, but but I guess that's like somewhat unavoidable when you have these fields of like thirty thousand players and stuff like that, right? Th there is no way getting around that. I think so. Um, yeah, I, I don't really know. Like it's. Uh, I focus on playing poker. That's what I know. I don't know how to arrange tournaments. So these people know that way better than me. I don't have much, uh, yeah, smart. I, I don't have any 200 IQ input on that part. So, no. Right. Um, all right. Well, listen, my man, I appreciate you. I know we did a double pod today for uh, Coin River as well. And this is number 173, the Jeff Girls podcast in the book. It's been a month. It took me a while. I've been on the road. I haven't wanted to come back. But when I, I knew Henry... Uh, was was trying to set this up and help out. I, I do appreciate. It. I know we've never met, but I'm a big fan of how you carry yourself and your. You know, I just feel like you're a great Likewise. ambassador for the game and and very humble. And uh, I wish you a lot of success and look forward to meeting in person. And uh, thank you so much for taking the time. It really really means a lot. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate the kind words, and I'll see you soon. Yes. All right, guys. That's number 173 in the books. The world champ 2022 WSOP. There he is. 10 million richer. Well, 56%. And um, he's. Uh, we'll be seeing him very soon and we'll be on for some more podcasts coming up on a regular schedule. Thank you guys so much for watching and, and thank you to Espen. We'll see you soon. Cool. Bye.